Hello and welcome to Season 3, Episode 37 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. And now we're on to the main event. Linda van den Heffer spent 15 years in the corporate world before she decided to pursue her passion for conservation. And she has certainly been making up for lost time and is a hardworking and extremely dedicated member of the BirdLife South Africa team. Linda is the vulture project, project manager and focuses on the impact of lead poisoning in vultures. She is currently pursuing a PhD on the subject. Linda's passion and dedication is an inspiration and I look forward to hearing the latest on her work. Um, Linda recorded her presentation because of load shedding this evening. Um, she is with us and will answer some questions later on, but didn't want um, any, any potential issues to uh, spoil the show. So I will, I will start her video now um, and I hope you all enjoy it. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to apologize for not um, presenting this live. That was certainly the intention, um, but the closer we came to the day, I began to realize that the load shedding schedule may not allow me to do this live. So um, many of you, um, most of you who have followed this webinar from the beginning, you would have known that I presented on this topic a couple of years ago, but uh, a lot of things have happened since. Um, and we thought we were due for an update. So tonight, I'm going to give you a brief recap on what I've presented on the webinar before, which is just um, basically a summary of the prevalence of lead poisoning in South Africa's vultures. But then I'm going to move on to my most recent research, um, most of which was actually published quite recently. Before I continue, um, I would just like to raise an important issue, um, and that is the fact that this is a conversation about lead ammunition. It is not a conversation about hunting. I think it is unfortunate that the two topics are frequently confused. We need to focus on the issue of lead ammunition on its own without confusing it with hunting, which can be a highly emotive issue. So I ask that anyone listening tonight will please be mindful of that and not confuse the two topics. So as most of you will know, um, our vultures really are in very bad shape. Um, of South Africa's nine vulture species, four are critically endangered. Um, the white-backed vulture, the hooded vulture, and the white-headed vulture featured there in the top left corner. They are regarded as globally critically endangered, um, which is one step away from extinction in the wild. And then the bearded vulture at the bottom there um, is regarded as um, regionally critically endangered. Our lapid faced vultures are marginally better off, um, listed as endangered, while our cave vultures were recently uplisted from endangered to vulnerable. So we think that their populations are stabilizing. Um, we're certainly not complacent about it, um, as you know, things can change very quickly. So we know that um, close to 60% of vulture mortalities are attributable to, to poisoning, and that's poisoning in various forms. It's either intentional poisoning, when poachers deliberately target vultures um, because they don't want vultures to give away the position of a poached carcass, or they are deliberately targeted for belief-based use. Um, unfortunately, vultures also become the unintentional victims of poisoning um, when they are fall victim to predator control when farmers put out poison baits to control populations of jackal or caracal, for instance, or as is the topic tonight, um, when they poison um, themselves by feeding on the carcasses of animals that have been shot with lead ammunition. So before we continue, some background on lead itself. Lead is what we call a heavy metal. Um, it's got an atomic weight of 207, um, if you compare that with carbon, which is regarded as a light element, um, carbon only has an atomic weight of 16. Um, lead is one of the most useful substances known to man, um, it's incredibly dense and heavy, but at the same time it's very soft and malleable. It's also got a very low melting point and it is corrosion resistant, um, which is very unusual for a metal. So, as such, it is very popular in industry and it has been as such um, since Roman times. 
and because of its popularity in, in, in industrial processes, um, it is just proliferated in the environment. So much so that there is not a surface in any room um, that is not that does not contain lead on it. Unfortunately, despite its usefulness, it is also incredibly toxic. And if you want to know an element by the company it keeps, if you look at lead down there among all the other heavy metals, um, it's it's situated among the most toxic substances known to, to man. You can see there next to thallium and mercury. So lead is very toxic. The most common uses of lead today is in lead acid batteries, uh, which we use in our cars, and that's because of its um, corrosion resistant properties. It was also um, used as an anti-knocking agent in leaded fuel, um, which fortunately was uh, phased out in South Africa in 2006. However, leaded fuel is still used in some countries, and I think it's also still used in aviation fuel. Lead was also commonly used in paint um, because it, it had good pigmentation properties, and it was also, it's also frequently used in solder. And then obviously also in fishing weights um, used for fishing today, and in lead ammunition, not only in handgun and rifle ammunition, but also in shotgun ammunition. So the problem with lead is that it mimics other metals um, and unfortunately it mimics metals which are essential to the health of organisms, metals such as zinc and calcium. Um, it also has a very strong affinity for what we call sulfhydryl groups. If you can see there in the bottom diagram, um, what lead does, it binds to amino acids in, instead of those sulfhydryl groups and that can have huge implications for the formation of proteins. It's also one of the few toxins that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, as you know, the blood-brain barrier evolved to keep toxins um, from entering the brain. Um, unfortunately, lead can bypass that barrier, and the way it does that is a lecture in itself. Um, I, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, it affects every organ system in the body, uh, which makes it very difficult to diagnose because lead results in such a broad range of symptoms and that can be attributable to anything um, but it is not most notable for its effect on the nervous system and it can create all sorts of problems um, in that area unfortunately it's also children that are particularly vulnerable um, children have growing bodies and as such their calcium demands are very high and in the presence of lead um, the wrongful uptake of lead in, instead of calcium can cause all sorts of developmental issues. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I will kick off tonight's presentation by just giving you a brief recap on the prevalence of lead poisoning in South Africa's vultures. Um, this was research that I did in 2016 through 18. I will then move on to my most recent um, research which sought to find scientific proof for what we thought was the source of lead poisoning in vultures. Um, I will then discuss the physiological effects of lead on vultures and then also flowing from that, um, the effects that we're starting to see that it has on their movement behavior. So in 2016, um, I basically traveled all over South Africa to collect blood and bone samples from not only vultures, um, but any raptor or large terrestrial bird that I could lay my hands on. And it really took me all over the country. Um, my biggest sample sites were up in Hoodsprite, around in the Kruger area, up at Bloberg Nature Reserve, northern KwaZulu-Natal, and then also around Kimberley in the Northern Cape, uh, where I focused a lot of attention on Dronfield Nature Reserve, uh, where there's a whiteback vulture breeding colony. Before I share the results of that, um, just a brief word on how we interpret blood lead levels in birds. Um, we use a, a term called micrograms per deciliter. And just to explain that, um, a microgram is a millionth of a gram and a deciliter is 100 milliliters. So we basically put it in terms of a millionth of a gram per 100 milliliters. And that should give you some idea of how little lead is required um, before it is regarded in, in toxicity terms. So generally in birds, um, anything less than 10 micrograms per deciliter in the blood is regarded as what we call background exposure. Um, 
and it, it cannot severely impair normal physiological functioning, although that can differ among species. Um, having said that, though, um, there is no such thing as safe levels of lead. Any lead in the system is bad. Um, it's just the severity of the effect um, that we're talking about here. Once things start going over 10 micrograms per deciliter, it starts to get a little bit more serious. Um, we start to see what we call the first delta A lead depression, which I'm going to talk in detail about later. And as things go higher, it just gets progressively worse. Um, once things go over 50 micrograms per deciliter, you start seeing anemia, lesions in tissues, weight loss, etc. And anything over 100 can lead to mortality. Um, having said that, this is a broad guideline. Um, you know, the effects of lead can vary um, immensely between species, not only between species, but between individuals of the same species. And it will affect very much on the general health of the bird as well. So I will look at what we found in vultures first. Um, first, the whiteback vultures um, up at Hootsprate um, near Kruger National Park. We found an average um, blood lead level among the birds. They are 14.7. The highest was 47. And we found that roughly two thirds of the birds were over 10 micrograms per deciliter. And this is a pattern that repeated itself uh, throughout South Africa. Um, I found similar levels at Shishlui in Pelosi Park, where the average was 23, the highest was 135, um, and 73% of the birds were over 10. Um, the worrying results came from Dronfield Nature Reserve, where, as I mentioned earlier, there's a whiteback vulture breeding colony there. And uh, in 2016 and 2017, I sampled some of the chicks there. And the average um, was 14.4, and the highest was 85. And again, close to two thirds of the birds were over 10 micrograms per deciliter. When I went back there in 2019, I find, found that the average had shot up to 28 micrograms per deciliter. Um, the highest um, lead level was in a chick at 180 micrograms per deciliter. In fact, that year, seven of the chicks that we sampled were over 100 micrograms per deciliter and all of the birds were over 10 micrograms per deciliter. Um, I sampled about 15 Cape vultures up at Bloberg Nature Reserve. Um, the, the average there was close to 30. Um, the max was 109, and there were two birds at that level, um, and 80% of the birds were over 10 micrograms per deciliter. I subsequently um, had a chance to sample birds in the Eastern Cape as well. Um, the blood lead levels among those birds were not as high, however, they were the odd individual who were over 100 micrograms per deciliter as well. So the next question was obviously how this compared um, to other bird species, other raptors um, and terrestrial bird species. And in that sense, I, I took samples from a variety of bird species, anything from a quarry busted, Litwigs busted, Booted eagle, spotted eagle owl over there, secretary bird. And in summary, in all of those birds, all the samples that I took were within background exposure. And that immediately um, brought to our attention the fact that lead poisoning in South Africa's birds seems to be a problem for the scavenging birds only. And you can see it there in black and white um, at the top, um, white back vultures and cape vultures persistent lead poisoning across South Africa. It's very clear. And if you compare that to other bird species down at the bottom, um, it is clear that this seems to be a vulture problem. I did collect a couple of samples from leopard faced vultures. Um, however, it was really not enough for me to reach a meaningful conclusion. My colleague, um, Dr. Sonia Kruger at Isenbelo Kazeri Wildlife, she has also evaluated the issue in bearded vultures and she picked up very high bone lead levels in them as well. Um, to date, um, we have not evaluated um, lead levels in hooded vultures or white-headed vultures. So from these results, we could already make some very interesting conclusions. Um, first of all, there was the scavenging lifestyle of vultures to um, consider. Um, from our results, it was clear that scavenging birds were being affected, while non-scavenging birds were only exposed to background levels. We also had to look at lead poisoning in the chicks, and from there we, we saw some interesting results. Um, if you look at the chicks at Drumfield, um, they're confined to a very small area. 
if the lead in those chicks came purely from the environment, you would have expected all the chicks to have similar blood lead levels, but they didn't. Um, some 34% um, of the birds had blood lead levels under 10 background exposure, whereas the balance had blood lead levels over 10, and, where, and some of them were extremely high. So the only other possible source of lead in those chicks could have been what they were feed, fed by their parents. Um, they haven't fledged yet, they can't fly themselves. So whatever they were ingesting, they were getting from their parents. And that combined with the fact that these are obligate scavengers, but scavenging birds, in other words, birds that depend almost exclusively on scavenging as a source of food, led us to conclude that this is probably coming from lead ammunition embedded in the carcasses of animals that have been shot with lead ammunition. So these results were published in 2019, and but this was only the beginning, and we soon realized that we're going to have to do some more research to shed light on this issue. So even though we thought we had identified the source, uh, we were all but sure that this was coming from lead ammunition, we needed to find scientific evidence from that for that, and that is why we then moved on to the next phase of the research and this is where things started to develop into a PhD for me and that was to use scientific research methods to find the source of lead poisoning in whiteback vulture chicks. So before we started this whole process we did a bit of a desktop exercise and we tried to identify every single source of lead that the chicks at Drumfield could potentially be exposed to. Um, this can range from environmental lead um, in the soil, in the dust, um, because they can ingest soil or dust when they preen their feathers, um, for instance, uh, from the air that they breathe or in the water that they are consuming. Uh, we did eliminate water very quickly. Um, I sampled the water at Drumfield Nature Reserve and the levels in the, of lead in the water, they were below the levels of detection. I couldn't even pick it up. Um, we also had to look at anthropogenic sources of lead. Um, most importantly, we had to look at mining. Um, South Africa is a resource rich country and there's mining all over the place. I especially had to look at uranium mining because uranium through radioactive decay give rise to lead. Um, and lead will always be where your uranium mining is taking place. I also had to look at lead mining. Um, which in South Africa is limited to the towns of Pofadar and Achenais in the Northern Cape. I also had to look at um, coal combustion and then obviously um, at the processes that are involved in, in those mining operations. I looked at industrial sources of lead. Um, this I did not do it mys do myself. I got this from literature um, at the petrochemical industry, for instance, and, and, and the heavy industry that is going on around Johannesburg, for instance, in Tahting, and also in Mossel Bay and um, Port Elizabeth. I then also had to look at legacy lead, um, and by that I mean the lead from leaded fuel that had set it on, settled on road ver verges. Um, that lead will never go away, it will be there in perpetuity, um, so we needed to look at that as well. And then obviously I had to look at leaded ammunition. Before I continue, I need to issue a health warning um, because things are about to get quite technical. However, I don't want you to get quite too hung up on it. Um, I just want to show you the background so that you know we didn't just get up one morning and decided that this was lead ammunition. Um, we did give it some careful thought and we also put in some long hours at the laboratory. As I mentioned briefly, um, I chose as my study site um, the breeding colony, the whiteback vulture breeding colony at Grantfield Nature Reserve, which is situated just north of Kimberley in Northern Cape Province. It's a 14,000 hectare reserve, um, mostly open savanna, um, where whiteback vultures breed in these big camel thorn trees. And it is arguably one of the most important breeding clusters of whiteback vultures in the Northern Cape. Before I even collected a single sample, um, I could e already eliminate um, several potential sources of lead poisoning in the whiteback vulture chicks at Brownfield. Um, for, to do this, I relied heavily on a paper published by de Villiers et al. in 2010. 
and she went around South Africa. I'm going to talk about her a little bit more later, um, but she went around South Africa and she collected close to a thousand soil samples um, across South Africa and she she worked out what the lead levels in those samples were. And based on her findings, she identified only four regions in South Africa where lead levels are really, really um, unusually high. Um, those are around Gauteng, um, as you would expect, because of the mining and the industrial activity in that area. Um, she also identified an area around the towns of Achimais in the Northern Cape. And that's because of that's where South Africa's only active lead mine is located. She also identified um, the area around Port Elizabeth. It may be a bit um, difficult to see on the map there, um, but bec also because of the heavy industry that's going on there. And then also around the town of Mossel Bay. Um, because of the petrochemical industry that is active in that area. So based on that, I then overlapped that with whiteback vulture distribution in South Africa. Um, and from that, I could already eliminate these two areas as possible sources of lead in um, the vultures at, White, at Donfield Nature Reserve. Um, whiteback vulture distribution over the region of Gauteng is limited. Um, however, they do occur there, so I still wanted to look at the uranium mines there um, especially. And then also here in the Northern Cape, um, around the towns of Achenais and Popwader, um, that area is not classically part of um, vultures range in South Africa, um, but we have been seeing um, increasing numbers of vultures in that area in recent years, um, mostly driven by the um, drought that is still active in that area. So I had to look at that, and then I also went and I collected several soil samples um, around Kimberley within a 120 kilometer radius of Kimberley. Um, my, I based my theory on the fact um, that whiteback vulture adults are unlikely to forage beyond that. Um, however, um, they are certainly cap capable of flying um, further than that, um, even during the breeding season. So. Unfortunately, my, my sample size will not be exhausted in that sense. I also collected a soil sample in Northwest Province um, near the small town of Hartbeersfontein, um, where there's a, an active uranium mine, and I collected a soil sample from the mine tailings there. So, um, in order to identify the source of um, lead poisoning in white buckle to chicks at Drumfield, I used a two pronged approach. Um, First and foremost, I used um, lead isotopes, which I'm going to discuss in detail just now. And I also looked at the concentration in the potential sources, um, because not all um, potential sources have enough lead to account for the, the lead that we're seeing in vulture blood. For instance, um, as I mentioned earlier, this allowed me to immediately exclude the water drop field because I could not pick up any detectable levels of lead in the water at Drumfield Nature Reserve. So this is where the science starts. If I can briefly take you back to high school science, um, isotopes are members of the same element. Um, they've got the same number of protons, but they've got different numbers of neutrons. So for instance, lead has got four isotopes, and they are all lead. The only difference is lies in the number of neutrons they have in their core. So for instance, we've got lead 204, we've got lead 206, lead 207, and lead 208. So all of these isotopes are lead, they just have different numbers of neutrons. And as a result, they also have different weights. So lead 208, for instance, is heavier than lead 207. So all four of these isotopes occur in rocks in differing ratios. And that is because as a result of geochemical processes, which I'm not gonna go into too much detail now, but feel free to ask me later. Um, and as a result, this is, has made it very useful in pinpointing where lead pollution is coming from, because every single source of lead will have different ratios of these four um, isotopes, um, which can almost be seen as a signature and identifier in pinpointing a specific um, type of rock. So using these unique isotopic signatures, I could then go and answer the following research questions. I could ask, what are the ratios of these four isotopes in the different potential sources of lead poisoning in the whiteback vulture chicks at Drumfield Nature Reserve? And do those unique signatures 
explain the lead isotope ratios that I'm seeing in bolted blood. So obviously I couldn't do this on my own. Um, we approached um, some very clever geoscientists at the University of the Witwatersrand and the University of Johannesburg to help us with this. Um, this was quite a unique project. Um, this has never been attempted um, at any university um, in Africa at the time, and they were very, very keen to get involved. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Things started out at the Witz Isotope Geoscience Laboratory um, in Johannesburg. And the reason why we needed to use this laboratory is because it's um, an ultra clean laboratory, and which is trace metal clean. And this was incredibly important um, because, um, as I mentioned earlier, lead is literally everywhere in the environment. It's in the air. It's on any surface that you touch. If I was going to make sure that I got accurate isotopic signatures out of the samples that I analyzed, I needed to make sure that there was no cross-contamination um, from lead in the immediate environment. So the lady that you see there is Dr. Linda Iacheri um, at Wits University. Um, she helped me to um, isolate the lead in the samples that I brought to her. So first of all, we started with the blood samples. Um, I collected 38 blood samples from the Chicks at Brumfield Nature Reserve. Um, before we could do anything, she needed to remove all the organic material. Um, and eventually, after a lengthy process, um, she needed to make sure that she removed everything, every single metal except lead from that sample. And the result was this. Um, the lead, the, all the lead that was in the vulture blood um, suspended in nitric acid, um, which was then ready for analysis. So I then took those samples over to the Department of Geology at the University of Johannesburg, um, where they've got one of these beauties. Um, it's called an MC ICPMS, um, which stands for Multi Collector Inductively Coupled Plasma Mass Spectrometer, if you're interested in the details. And uh, forgive me if my explanation is very simplistic, but what it does is that your, your sample is inserted on the left here. It then fires a, a beam of um, lead at atoms out of your sample into this tube here um, around this, this bend here. And as it rounds the bend, the different isotopes differentiate into their different weights. Um, and those isotopes are then collected into these cups here. I think they're called Faraday cups. And based on that, um, the machine then calculates the different ratios of these isotopes in your sample. I was then given a spreadsheet, um, all the different isotopic ratios of the samples that I had analyzed. And uh, quite frankly, after I cried myself to sleep for a couple of months, I was finally able to produce a graph that you can see there. So what I did here, um, on the left, you can see I plotted um, the ratio of lead 207 um, and lead 206 against the blood lead concentration of the chicks. And, um, the black dots there are the isotopic ratios of the lead found in the white black vulture chicks at Brownfield Nature Reserve. So, for instance, you can see these seven chicks here all had blood lead levels over 100 micrograms per deciliter, um, and these are the different isotopic ratios for lead 207 and lead 206. So, once I've graphed this, I could then compare it to the isotopic ratios of um, several other potential sources. For instance, I could compare it to atmospheric lead, um, which is um, depicted in pink there. And you can see there is very little overlap um, between the lead levels, in, the lead isotopic ratios of the chicks at Brownfield and the atmospheric lead. Interestingly, um, what you can see there in yellow um, is, are the isotopic ratios of legacy lead from fuel. Um, and it's quite interesting the extent to which the atmospheric lead um, overlaps with the legacy lead from fuel. So that was quite interesting. But immediately there, I could eliminate atmospheric lead and legacy lead from fuel. Um, I then compare it to coal, um, local South African coal, um, very little overlap. There was about three chicks that had similar um, isotopic signatures to coal. Um, and based on that, we could eliminate coal as well. The soil samples were interesting. Um, about half of the chicks had isotopic signatures similar to soil. So that was something I needed to look at and something I'll get back to later. Um, but then if you look at the ammunition 
all of the chicks had isotopic signatures similar to um, ammunition. So that those were the two things take away things from this graph. I could eliminate everything um, except ammunition and soil. I then had a look at uranium. Um, as you can see on the graph here, yeah, I plotted lead 206 and lead 207 to lead 208 and lead 206. And again, um, the black triangles represent the isotopic ratios found in vulture blood. If you compare that, um, the orangey triangles here, these are the isotopic ratios um, from water samples taken at a uranium mine in um, Gauteng. You can see very, very little overlap with the white pack vultures. Um, and then the green at the top here was taken from mine tailings at a uranium dam in Namibia. Um, I included that here because I thought, you know, interesting because we know South African vultures do forage in Namibia. Um, but those two sources you can see do not significantly contribute to lead levels in white pack vultures. Uh, what you can see here at the um, bottom left, um, this pink triangle here, this is the sample I took from the town of that, that uranium mine near the town of Hartbeersfontein in um, Northwest province. Um, it was so different from the isotopic ratios of white black vultures that I had to put in an axis break just to maintain um, the scale here. So what you can, what we learn from this graph is basically that pure uranium in South Africa, uranium mined in South Africa, is completely different um, from the lead that we see in um, white black vulture chicks, and then also the lead found in the mine tailings. Um, at around uranium mines in the Gauteng province is also not responsible for the lead that we find in white back vulture chicks at Drumfield Nature Reserve. I then looked at lead mining. Um, this is the lead mined up um, around um, Achanais and Bofadr, just south of Namibia. And again, um, the black represents the ratios that found in vulture blood and the ratios of the lead mined up in that region. Um, is completely different. This we should have expected because there's really very little overlap um, between the foraging range of white back vultures in South Africa and the lead mining district. But as I said earlier, um, we needed to look at it because we have seen increasing numbers of vultures in that area. But um, based on this, we can safely eliminate lead mining in South Africa as a source of lead poisoning in white back vulture chicks. So that left us with two possible sources of lead poisoning um, of the chicks at Longfield Nature Reserve, either the soil or the ammunition. And those were the only two um, options that were left. Um, I then had to look elsewhere um, to, to tease out which of those two are the most likely culprit of lead poisoning in those vulture chicks. Um, for this, I relied on a paper by de Villiers et al. I think I mentioned her earlier. She collected um, close to a thousand samples, um, soil samples across South Africa to determine the lead levels in those soil samples. Um, and she found that of those 942 soil samples, only 3% had an extractable lead level of over one micrograms per gram. So what extractable means, um, means if that's not the total lead found in the sample, but that is the amount of lead in that sample that is available for biological uptake. So not all the so lead in, in a soil sample will be available for organisms to take up into their bodies. Um, only a fraction of that will be. And she found that for South African soil samples, only 3% were over one micrograms per gram. So that is very small indeed. She found um, South African soil sample um, to be generally very poor in lead. And that is mainly attributable to the limited industry in our country compared to countries in Northern Europe, for instance. So I then um, sampled the soils at Dronfield Nature Reserve and I um, analyzed the samples to find out what the lead levels were in the soil samples at Dronfield. And the average lead level was eight micrograms per gram. And that was true for all the soil samples that I collected as part of this study. So if you now compare that to ammunition, which is almost pure lead. Um, I think a bullet is over 99% lead. And you overlap that and you consider that in conjunction with the fact that vultures are obligate scavengers. They rely on carrion almost exclusively as a source of food. Um, that explains much better 
the high lead levels that we are seeing in some of the birds um, than soil does. And also, as I said earlier, uh, as part of my original paper, if soil was the big culprit in causing lead poisoning in vultures, you would have expected the vulture chicks at Drumfield to have similar blood lead levels, but they didn't. Some of them were extremely high and some of them were within background levels. So it is likely that the birds within background levels are getting some of their lead from soil, but that the birds that are at elevated levels, i.e. over 10 micrograms per deciliter, are obtaining additional lead from the ammunition that they are probably ingesting in the carrion fed to them by their parents. So in summary, um, we could eliminate mining as a source of lead poisoning in white white vulture chicks, and that includes lead from uranium mining, lead mining um, and coal combustion, and that includes the mining processes. Uh, we also could eliminate lead from industry. We could eliminate legacy lead from fuel, um, from lead from the atmosphere, as well as the water that they are drinking at Drumfield, um, and we could eliminate water purely because the lead levels were below the limits of detection. Um, the two main sources were um, definitely ammunition, um, we identified that, and then also soil and dust. And I put both a tick mark and a cross there because um, I think soil is contributing to half of the chicks uh, that are being exposed to soil to some extent. Um, but I think the overarching culprit is ammunition, especially in the birds that have got very high lead levels. <clears throat> so this is where the lead is coming from. Um, what you can see on the left there are some x-rays that were provided to me by members of the National Hunting and Shooting Association. At the top you can see a springbok um, that was killed with a headshot from a 0.308 lead core bullet. Um, the, the shot went in at the neck and it just sprayed throughout the, um, the head of the animal and then the bottom animal was shot in the chest. Um, and that lead just um, distributed all through the, the internal organs. So this is what a, a lead bullet is meant to do. It is meant to um, cause as much damage as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, but the problem there is the level of fragmentation. So, and also the bigger problem is the, are the fragments that you can't see, um, the so-called nanoparticles. Um, vultures have got a very, very acidic stomach. So as, as soon as those small particles hit the stomach of a vulture, um, the uptake of lead into the bloodstream will be very, very quickly. So this is a typical scene um, in Zilliland, for instance, on a hunting farm. Um, the animal will be taken to the abattoir where it will be eviscerated um, and the meat around the wound channel will be taken off, like, taken out and uh, whatever is left and not consumed by the, um, the hunters themselves, it will be put out at these vulture restaurants for the scavengers to <clears throat> consume. Um, so the lead is coming from multiple sources. Um, it's from gut piles, from vulture restaurants, um, for wildlife ma management, for Ines for instance, when um, farmers have got an excess of giraffe balls and that they take off and they leave it in the field for vultures to consume, and from hunting and mass culling operations as well. So I'm very glad to say that these results were finally published about a month ago in the journal Environmental Science and Pollution Research. And um, this was a difficult process, um, it took over four years. Lots of things had to happen and there were delays because of COVID. So I'm very proud that this paper is finally out there. And if there's any of you out there who would like to read it, please let me know um, and I will be happy to send it to you. That brings us to the next section, um, the next part of my PhD, which aimed to look at the physiological effects of lead on um, white back vultures and cave vultures as well. We know from a range of studies that have previously been conducted on bird species um, that lead can cause all sorts of damage to the avian body system. Um, it affects, like in humans, every organ system, the digestive system. It can lead to low reproductive success. Um, it can impair skeletal development, um, impair the nervous system, etc. Um, the most marked effect, though, is on the circulatory system um, when it prevents the formation of new red blood cells. And all these studies have found that even at low lead, lead levels, um, many bird species become less fit because of the impairment of lead in their system. 
So I specifically wanted to look at the effect of lead on a vulture's ability to manufacture new, new red blood cells. Um, so as many of you may, may know, um, our blood consists mainly of three parts. Um, the most, for the most part, it consists of red blood cells, um, but then there's also two other sections taken up by the plasma and the white blood cells. And it's the red blood cells that are in, responsible for carrying oxygen throughout the system. So if we're not manufacturing enough red blood cells, we are we become anemic. Now we know from previous studies um, that the percentage red blood cells in white blood cultures um, is at around 44%. However, I looked at the chicks at Bromfield and their red, red blood cells take up only about 33% of the total blood volume. So we needed to find out what was going on there. So to do that, um, I wanted to look at vultures' ability to manufacture heme. And what you can see on the right there is the steps that the body goes through to manufacture heme. And we know from previous studies that lead interferes in that second step um, when delta amino levulinic acid is convert, converted to porphyrinoic and the body does that um, through the help of an enzyme called delta a -lat. Now lead interferes in that reaction by binding to that enzyme instead of zinc um, and that basically messes up that entire pathway preventing heat, the proper formation of heat. So to look at this um, I um, went back to my old haunting grounds at Bronfield and I collected some samples I flash froze them on liquid nitrogen because we needed to um, make sure that the, that enzyme um, doesn't didn't denature. I then took those samples to the University of KwaZulu Natal, where some biochemists helped me to figure this out. And what that lady is basically doing at the top there, she is reactivating um, the enzyme to see how much porphyrinogen formed. And what you can see on the little tray on the left there, the pinker the sample, the more porphyrinogen formed. Um, and um, in theory, um, in those samples, the effect of lead would have been less. Whereas you can see on the samples that are very pale, you would expect um, that those samples to have very high lead levels. So once you plot the results on a, on a graph, you get this beautiful regression. And what this basically shows is that the higher the blood lead level goes, um, the more problematic the birds find it to manufacture heme. So these birds are typically very anemic. Um, and we calculated that in white back vulture chicks, um, at about 62 micrograms per deciliter of lead in the blood, um, things start going seriously wrong. And we also calculated that once things go over 100 micrograms per deciliter, they start displaying um, compromised liver function as well. I then wanted to see if um, there are similar problems in, in Cape vultures. So over two years in 2020 and 2022, I went to a Cape vulture breeding colony um, at Cardinal Sprite. Um, between the towns of Lady Grey and Barclay East in Eastern Cape Province. And with the help of a brilliant climbing team, I collected some blood samples from the chicks on that colony. Um, I don't think the photographs here can adequately convey how challenging these conditions were. Um, if you look at that central photo there, if I can switch on my pointer here, um, this is the cliff, there's a chick down there. Um, and somewhere around here, you can see two climbers abseiling down. Those cliffs were absolutely enormous, and um, I was very happy to um, supervise safely from a distance. From that, we got similar results. Um, Cape vultures also, the higher the lead levels, the more compromised their ability to manufacture heme. Um, interestingly, though, in Cape vultures, um, that cutoff point where we calculated that things start going seriously wrong, Okay, vultures, that seems to be at 10 micrograms per deciliter. So from this, it seems to us that cape vultures seem to be much more sensitive to the effects of lead than white back vultures. Um, we are not really sure why that may be. So with that, I come to the final part of my presentation, um, which is the most recent part of my research, um, investigating the impact of um, lead on the movement behavior of white back vulture chicks. And basically from this, what I wanted to know is 
what happens to white back to chicks with blood lead levels over 16.2 micrograms per deciliter. So I, I calculated that once things go over that level, there, there is probably going to be issues, and we wanted to see if that holds true. So in 2020 and 2021, I went back to Dronfield Nature Reserve and we fitted um, tracking devices to white back to chicks there that were on the verge of fledging. And we selected um, chicks with a range of blood lead levels, um, some with very low blood lead levels and some with very high lead levels. And most importantly, um, also chicks that had a blood lead level over that cutoff point of 62 micrograms per deciliter. I have not analysed the data yet, um, but so far we are seeing some very interesting results. For instance, um, this is um, uh, two of the chicks that I'm going to show you now from the 2020 batch. Um, on the left, you can see a chick named Vintbom. Um, I'm not going to explain where that thing comes from. Vintbom had a blood lead level as a chick of only four micrograms per deciliter, um, very low. Once she fledged, um, she was very active um, of in, in the first two months after fledging. She flew around Brownfield and she still came home at night um, to roost with mom and dad. But during the day, she actively explored her surroundings. When you compare that to Magellan, um, who had a blood lead level of 71, um, you can see that things are rather different. Um, Magellan fledged, but she then was very, very inactive. She would flop to the nearby tree and flop back, maybe flop to the Volturay strand and flop back and go back to the nest. But her activity um, during the first two and a half to three months of her um, life as a fledged chick was very, very limited. I saw similar results the following year. Um, this on the left, you can see Myrtle. Um, Myrtle, she had a blood lead level of 46 micrograms per deciliter. Again, uh, Myrtle came home every night um, to her nest, um, but during the day, she was in very, um, incredibly active. Um, if you compare that to Elsie, Elsie had a blood lead level of 79. Um, again, similar to what I saw in Magellan, um, she pledged but then was very lethargic. Um, she would flop to the next tree and flop back, and she didn't do much of anything um, other than that. If you look at it a little bit further, um, data I recently downloaded. Um, this is Norman. Norman fledged from Donfield um, and then hung around Donfield for a couple of months, but then took off to southern Botswana, and he hung around there in the Northern Cape for quite some time. Um, Kevin um, flew all the way to central Angola and back. Um, he is now back in um, South Africa. And these are normal behaviours that you would expect from juvenile whiteback vultures. Um, Elsie, on the other hand, um, in the same time period, remained fast to her nest. Um, she's done almost no movement whatsoever. And this is concerning. And it's based on this that we are starting to think that the movement behavior, the lack of movement behavior, is backing up our theory um, that once white back vulture chicks reach a blood lead level of 62, things start to go south very, very quickly. So in summary, um, I think lead poisoning as a sublethal threat to South Africa's vulture populations is hugely underestimated. Um, we now know um, that the chicks that fledge with significant body burdens of lead suffer from anemia and liver damage. Um, this is concerning because we know that, you know, juveniles that um, during their first year of life, especially these large raptors, they face enormous ch challenges, um, even under normal circumstances, if they, they now fledge with compromised health as well. Um, it just limits their chances of survival that, that much more. Um, the irony for me is, is that lead poisoning in vultures is one of the few conservation measures um, that is conservation issues that are that is perfectly preventable and that is why I urge people to make the switch to lead free ammunition as soon as possible. I think progress on this issue is hampered by a variety of things um, most importantly in a lack of awareness and um, not only of the risk that it may pose to our vulture populations but also to the risk about the risk that it may pose to humans themselves. Um, those of you who regularly hunt for meat, um, you don't know um, whether there are fragments of lead ammunition embedded in the meat that you take home to your your, your families. Um, another issue is the availability of alternatives. Um, that's frequently cited as um, a limiting factor, but there's a lot of local manufacturers that have now 
um, come to the party and I list them there, those are the ones that I'm aware of and that have now come to the party and are um, manufacturing more cost of it effective alternatives to, for lead free um, ammunition. Um, there's also um, a willingness to change and I think a lack of willingness to change and that's frequently rooted in the fact that any discussion around lead ammunition is perceived as criticism of hunting and that is why I make it perfectly clear at the beginning of this talk is that we must not confuse the two issues. Um, a discussion around lead ammunition for me has got nothing to do with hunting as a hobby or as a profession. Um, it's a discussion about lead ammunition itself and I think moving forward we need to keep that in mind. Before I go away, um, there are just a couple of people that I want to thank by name. Um, over at the University of the Witwatersrand, Dr. Grant Bybee, who literally took a meeting with complete strangers um, in 2019 to discuss this project. And this whole pro project flowed from there. Um, then also Dr. Linda Iacheri at the Geosciences Laboratory um, for the many long hours that she put in, so meticulous, um, so hardworking. Um, I will be eternally grateful. Uh, she, I think she is my favorite Italian. Then over at the University of Johannesburg, Professor Marlena Alberg, um, one of the cleverest women I know, um, who continued to take my calls even after I broke one of her electronic pipettes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and then to Henriette Uckerman, um, the technician at the uh, MCICPMS, also put in so many hours. Um, I will never forget the late nights, some nights working until 10, 10 o'clock um, because the machine was booked out the next day for another project. And then also at the University of Kuzulu Natal, um, Professor Teresa Kutzer and Dr. Lauren Ayson, who was willing to take this project on. Um, also, again, taking a call from a complete stranger, running with a method methodology that had never been used in this country before. Um, to all of these people, um, none of this would have been possible without you, and I will be eternally grateful um, for all your help and enthusiasm. And then finally, and most importantly, um, to Neville and Pamela Isdell, as well as their daughter, um, Cara Isdell Lee, and Jessica Slackjell from the Mary Oppenheim and Daughters Foundation. Um, it is your generous financial um, support that made this research possible, and I will be eternally grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda. That was a fantastic presentation and, and covered a quite a technical topic very, very well. Thank you. Um, and uh, there have been lots of questions coming in and lots of comments in the chat, which I'm sure you've been reading. Um, before we get on to the questions, uh, I just want to quickly remind everyone to uh, please join us next week uh, for our uh, next uh, Conservation Conversations webinar, which will be the launch of a, a new book um, on about trees. It's a little shift away from, uh, from the bird focus, but of course, trees and birds are uh, very much linked. So please do join us for that. And then also just one last reminder, please, please uh, go and vote for the Mouse Free Marion project uh, before one o'clock. Uh, tomorrow. So I'll just quickly post the link in the chat again so people can go and do that while we're on question. Uh, so there are questions that popped up in the chat and in the Q&A feed, so I'll try and get to all of them. Um, but I think first, let's um, go to one that was asked quite often by, by a number of people um, about whether there's anything that can be done once the lead is in in the bird, can it be removed somehow? Can it be? Can the effects be reversed or lessened somehow? Um, this is really a question that needs to be answered by a rehabilitation specialist. Um, but I do know that um, many birds are submitted, subjected to what they call chelation therapy. Um, it's a treatment with a substance called um, calcium EDTA, and that can flush over a, a longish period, it can flush the lead out of the system. Um, however, that treatment in itself can be quite um, detrimental to the birds because it is my understanding that calcium EDTA 
doesn't just flush the lead, it will flush a whole slew of other things as well. So the treatment of lead poisoning birds is quite harsh and, and they, they don't necessarily always survive that. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, if, if there was a, a better way of doing it, that would be um, another option, but I the guess- The only way is to prevent it from happening. Exactly. And that is <laughs> lead free ammunition. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that is the best way, yeah. And as you said, that's it's quite a rare, uh, rare, rare, yeah, rare thing in conservation to to have something that is actually so easily preventable. So there were also exactly. yes. there were also some questions um, around that. Um, I'll just take Janet's question, um, asking you. You kind of mentioned, but it mentioned it. But what is there any chance lead can be removed? from ammunition, what are the alternatives? So maybe can you chat a, a bit about the alternatives that there are? Yes, um, so I listed a whole um, list, I gave a whole list of companies in South Africa that are currently manufacturing lead-free alternatives. Um, there are also um, um, lead-free alternatives available from the import market. So there is a whole range of options. Um, I think at the moment, um, the, the price differential between lead and lead-free is still there. Um, I think for imported ammunition, it's a bit more um, than the, the, the locally manufactured options. And I think also with the locally manufactured options, you have to load the round yourself. You can't buy a, re, uh, uh, a full round. You have to load it yourself. Um, but I mean, I'm not a hunter myself, but it is my understanding from many hunters that they actually prefer doing that. So, and I firmly believe, you know, um, on my basic knowledge of economics, you know, if if the demand is there, the prices are going to come down. And I think we need to keep that in mind. And, you know, the more um, hunters make the switch um, to lead-free alternatives, I'm sure that the, the, the quality and the cost of the rounds will just improve. Yeah, exactly. And then supply and demand. It would, yeah, exactly. As, if we can get more more people to um, to take them up, that will, will drive down the, the costs. Exactly. Um, yes. So that kind of links with um, Eleanor Mary's question, which I have now. Oh, there it is. Um, asking if you've started. Um, approaching hunting and other associations to, to try and promote the use of lead-free ammunition? Yes, absolutely. Um, I am a member of the National Lead Task Team, um, which is a working group that was established by um, the Department of Fisheries, Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. Um, and we've got various members on that task, task team. Um, they are conservationists. Um, and then there's also members from the national uh, or from SA Hunters um, on, the, on the class team as well. So it's it's a constant dialogue. Um, and we've very much followed the approach of it being a dialogue um, to find a solution to this problem. Um, the, the problem in, in places like Europe and, and North America and this conversation has become quite antagonistic. Um, and we have tried very much um, locally to, to keep things civil um, and to make sure that we find constructive solutions to this problem. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah something that needs to, as you say, the hunter, it's not a, you're not against hunting per se necessarily. It's the, the ammunition that is. Exactly. Important. Yes. Um, Helen asks, um, whether you plan to do similar research on other species of vultures. You mentioned, mentioned the white-headed and hooded vultures. Mm. I would love to. Um, just white-headed vultures, number one, have become few and far between. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a massive undertaking to catch enough individuals um, to come to any sort of conclusion there. Um, it is my understanding it's not a species that I've worked with too often, hooded vultures, um, but I've frequently heard people say that they are wily and that they are very difficult to catch uh, and to, to get a blood sample of them. Um, so it, it's definitely on the cards. Um, it's not immediately on the cards. Um, I still have plans for our water birds as well and to look at the effect of fishing weights on them. Um, but yes, um, one life is not enough. Um, I would dearly like to do all of these things. Absolutely. 
Um, but one one would assume that it, the um, impacts and prevalence of lead would be fairly similar. Because they they follow similar. It, exactly. Uh, yeah. Although I, I've got a theory about lapid face vultures. Um, the couple of samples that I did get off lapid face vultures, and um, the, the lead levels were quite low. And my unproven, um, unsubstantiated theory there is that you know lapid face vultures feed on ligaments and on skin. And the risk of them um, consuming um, fragments of lead are lower because of that, because the gyps vultures, the capes and the white backs, they will go for the large organs and the muscle tissue. So their risk of being exposed to fragments of lead are much higher. But as I said, that's that's just theory and it's completely unsubstantiated. Okay, interesting. Uh, it would be interesting if you can ever <laughs> uh, test mm. hypothesis. Um, yes. So you... <clears throat> Uh, but there's a couple of comments from from Jonathan Stacy, which I'll just read out, which are provide an, an interesting um, comparison to what happens with in in the US. Um, saying similar yes. positive elimination research has been done on lead uptake in Californian condors, arising from uh, various sources, concluding that lead in ammunition is a significant culprit. So aligning with your your results, this has been long established, and actions are now well underway for use of lead-free ammunition within the condor range um, and saying copper is a viable alternative, um, which is good that, that your results are, are um, kind of confirming what has been seen elsewhere in the world. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, it's no surprise because they're all scavenging birds and yes, it's exactly. a bat that is predisposing them to lead poisoning. Yes. Um, and let me just find the next question. Um, Ted van Mielen asks whether existing lead levels will drop over time. And I'm not sure, because once once the lead is in the bird, that's it, it's it's there forever. Um, so, okay. yeah. It's, it's, it's not in the blood forever. So uh -huh. um, the lead levels that I measured in the blood is, is, is it's a snapshot in time. So okay. the lead will be removed from the blood um, eventually. However, it, it then goes through the liver and the kidneys and it's then distributed throughout the body. And the bulk of it um, will eventually end up in, in the bone um, where it will remain for the lifetime of the bird. Um, and what is um, quite concerning is, um, you know, in times of calcium shortages um, or for egg laying females, for instance, when their calcium demands increase, they will remobilize lead out of the um, bones and poison themselves all over again. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, once they've got the lead in their system, it, it remains. Um, okay. That's, yeah, quite disturbing. Um, then quite a few people have asked whether you sampled uh, the carcasses at Volta Ritzman. Um the short answer is no, and there are two, re two reasons for that. Um, there's been a lot of confusion about whether lead can actually biomagnify. So and by that, I mean um, whether you, if I eat an antelope that has got, has taken up lead in its tissues through grazing or whatever, mm -hmm. if I, if that lead will then concentrate that, the further it goes up the food chain, for instance. Um, so when I started this project, I was I was very uncertain about whether that is possible. Um, and then on the other hand, there was the issue of the, the sheer range of possibilities that I was looking at. Um, because the vultures were not just feeding at the vulture restaurant at Donfield. They were eating all over the Northern Cape. Um, however, I, I have given that some thought afterwards. And it, it all comes back to the isotopic signatures in the soil as well. Because... If, if an antelope eats the grass, um, they will um, take on the isotopic signatures of the lead in the soil. And my assumption then afterwards was, well, then maybe, you know, the, the, the lead in those tissues of those animals um, would be similar to the soil. Um, but again, we, we need to look at the concentration as well. You know, there was two studies done on lead concentrations in tissues of animals in Southern Africa. The one was on um, livestock near the town of Porchestrum because there was concerns that there's um, maybe um, pollution going on there. Um, all those um, tissue lead levels were within um, levels that were acceptable for human consumption and you, you should hope so. 
Um, and then there was also a study done on um, springbok um, in southern Namibia, and they also found very, very, they found some lead levels in the livers, but in, in a very small percentage of the animals. So again, you need to ask yourself um, the question, you know, can lead levels like that explain the high lead levels that we see in, in, in the chicks? And the answer is no. Um, mm -hmm. So I doubt that um, vultures feeding on, on animals can significantly contribute to lead levels in their blood. Okay. Um, sorry, there's questions all over the place. I'm trying to make sure I've asked everything. Um, <clears throat> uh, Shashi asks how lead poisoning in chicks compares to the to you know the effects compares to what's seen in humans and she's asked about children. Have you looked at that or have you researched that at all? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. How how does it com the lead levels compare to humans? Uh, or the effects? Or the effects of lead. She says lead poisoning. So yeah, the effects of, the, of lead. So, I mean, as I said, you know, the lead affects every organ system in the body and that's certainly true of humans as well. Um, Again, women who have lead poisoning, they have got um, fertility issues, men as well. Um, it affects the body's um, ability to manufacture hemoglobin. Um, it causes neurological damage, um, muscular damage, um, skeletal development issues. So it's the same thing. I mean, it's um, in, in humans, the effects are particularly um, um, marked. In children, as I said, because their calcium demands are very high when they're growing, and I mean, there's a whole range of studies that have been done. I mean, they've even linked stuttering in children to um, high lead levels. Um, they've linked aggression in um, juveniles and um, teenagers um, to high lead levels. So the effects on a living organism is, is quite universal. Hmm. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, not really a question, but well, it is a question, but Marco asks whether um, the, your paper is um, accessible online? May, if it isn't, maybe you can... Um, it's your... not open access, unfortunately. Okay, maybe if you're happy to, you can drop your email in the chat and people can contact Absolutely. you. Absolutely, I'll do that quickly. Thanks. Uh, um, I think I've gone through most of the questions. There's just one more from Eleanor Mary, um, going back to the lead-free ammunition. Um, I think you probably uh, mentioned this, but is this um, what is what is the content of the lead-free ammunition, and um, are we sure that it's not also not harmful to vultures? Yeah, that's a good question. A very good question, Eleanor Mary. Um, most of the ammunition, um, the monolithics, so-called, are made from copper, although there are other substances used as well. Um, copper is also a heavy metal, um, but unlike lead. Copper in small quantities is actually an, an essential essential for living organisms. It's, the, it's an essential metal. Um, when it comes to a copper bullet, however, the, the fragmentation of a copper bullet is, is very, very low. So it's it will form one or two petals um, that break off, but really not enough. It's a pity I don't have that slide at hand to show that. Um, if you compare that to the level of fragmentation that I showed for a lead bullet, it's, 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 the, the difference is enormous. So the chances of a, a, a metal bullet, a copper bullet, passing through the digestive tract is much higher than um, for a lead bullet because there's just so many fragments. So I think the, the risk for a bird um, getting copper poisoning is, is much lower. Okay, that's good to hear. You don't want to replace one problem with another, so it's good that there <laughs> are <laughs> viable alternatives. Yeah. Uh, so I think we'll we'll leave it there. I think I've I've covered uh, most of the questions. Apologies if I did miss anyone's, but uh, yeah, I'm sure Linda wouldn't mind to answer any others over email if anyone has any burning questions. Um. So yeah, thank you very very much, Linda. That was fascinating, and you've done amazing work um, there's lots of appreciative messages especially uh, the the lengths that you went to get some of your samples so well done on on the great work and 
best of luck with with getting um yeah the the lead free ammunition taken up more widely i don't know if there's anything That's else you'd like to to say in closing, in closing? No, no, I think, I think that's it, we're done. <laughs> Great, well, thanks very much. And thanks very much to all our viewers uh, for joining us. And please do join us again for another episode next week. Good night, everyone. <laughs>